you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and we're going to read together beginning in verse 32 and reading through verse 42. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32 and reading through verse 42. Today I want us to think about that day in the life of our Lord when he communed not just with his disciples around the table eating bread and drinking cup in definition or redefinition of his kingdom, but the time that he communed with the Father in prayer as he learned to embrace the Father's will, pleading at first, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me and coming to the place that he could say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Sometimes when we think about the discipline of prayer, we think about it as though it is a wonderful game of of an arcade. I remember growing up from time to time we would go to our local pizza hut, And as a 90s kid in northwest Florida, the the gem of going to Pizza Hut on a Friday night was to have your your certificate from the Book It program. I don't know if y'all had Book It, but we had Book It. And that was a a reading rewards program, and we'd get a little certificate after reading so many books. uh, And you could go and redeem it at Pizza Hut for a personal pan pizza. And that was like the the top shelf. That was like what you wanted in life as a 90s kid. And, And when we went to Pizza Hut on Friday night, we didn't have uh, cell phones to borrow from our parents to play uh, all sorts of games. Instead, what we wanted was for our mom to dig into the bottom of that big purse of hers and find a few quarters so that we could go into that little room on the other side of the Pizza Hut called the Arcade. And in that Arcade room, they had a a game with a claw. Have y'all ever faced the claw game? That's right. And what you, what you know about the claw game is if your mama gave you a quarter and you put it in that slot and you began to work that claw and you held your tongue just right and you didn't breathe, it might just come down on that stuffed dolphin that you wanted to win. Am I right? Can, can I just tell you, I think for the vast majority of us, that's how we treat our prayer life. That when we come to the Father, we pop in our quarter, we don't breathe, and we hold our tongue just right in hopes that the claw might go down on just what it is that we want and make us a winner. And I want you to see today that because of what Jesus has done in the garden, communing with the Father, He doesn't just teach us how to pray. He enables us to pray. And it is in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that we come to understand that prayer is far more than a cosmic claw game where we seek to win all the things we want. But instead, it is in prayer that we learn how to be disciplined according to the Spirit and to have not just our spirits, but our flesh willing to do the Father's will. So if you have your Bible, you're able to stand and willing to stand, then I'll invite you to stand in honor of the public reading of Scripture. Mark chapter 14 and verse 32, this is what the Word of the Lord says. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, And he he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed, if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father... All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, 
Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Father, because of your Son Jesus, may we not be satisfied to have a spirit that is willing and a flesh that is weak. But may we by faith be conformed to the cross so that in body and in soul we might do your will. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. We've been telling the story over the last several weeks of this final week in Jesus' earthly ministry prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. We have come to April the 2nd, 33 A.D. This is Thursday before Jesus will be crucified on Friday. The day began with Jesus sending two of his disciples into the city to make preparations for he and his disciples to celebrate the Passover meal. It seems certain that Jesus has prepared this ahead of time. But he sends his disciples to go and to prepare the upper room. And it is there that Jesus will spend the majority of the evening with his disciples. It's there that all of the discourse in John 13 through John 17 uh, that it will take place as Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and then teaches them about the new kingdom that he ushers in by his death, burial, and resurrection. It is on that night that Jesus will observe the Passover meal and at the second cup of wine he will take a moment, break bread, and share it with his disciples saying, do this as all Often as you do in remembrance of me, it is there at the end of the supper that he will take the fourth glass of wine in the Passover meal and say, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. It is there on that night that Jesus will lead his disciples, less one, Judas Iscariot, who has now gone off to set the plot and betray his Lord. It is there on that night that Jesus and the 11 will sing the Hallel, Psalms 115 through 118, as they go out to the place that is familiar to them, a place where Jesus has often gone, a place of prayer. You see, the weight of what is coming weighs heavily on Jesus. I wonder this morning what weighs heavily on you. Is there something on your heart this morning? Maybe it's a disagreement with someone. Maybe it's a loss of somebody that you love. Maybe you came here this morning and your mind is in a thousand other places wondering how you're going to pay the bills that you know are due this week. Maybe it's your taxes. Y'all is coming. And maybe you're like somebody yesterday said, I, I got them done. Or maybe you're like me who said, we ain't done yet. <laughs> what, what's weighing on your heart today? More importantly than what's weighing on your heart is this question. Where do you go when your heart's weighed down? Where, where do you go when your soul is weary? Where do you go when you're like, Jesus, Father, let this hour pass from me. I don't want to face it. I don't want to go there. I don't want to address what has to be addressed. 
it was April the 26th, 2017. We were in a car furiously driving back to Pensacola, Florida. My mama and I had been in Savannah. We were there to celebrate my birthday and to watch my niece play ball. It was a good game. She had a doubleheader. First game, she didn't do very well. Second game, she hit a home run. In the middle of the night, we got a call from my dad that he'd fallen. And early that morning, we started making our way. And as we were making our way home from Savannah to Pensacola, we were getting calls from family members that they couldn't get daddy on the phone. And then once they got into the house, they realized that he was very sick, even unto death. And by the time we got there, he was in an emergency room fighting for his life. Just the day before, we'd been talking about difficulties in the life of the church that I pastored at the time and how in the middle of our weeping, we have to keep working. And as my mother faced a new reality, wondering how long would my dad be in the hospital, what kind of care would he require when he got out, she began to be overwhelmed with the weight of the hour. You've been there. Maybe you're there now. Maybe you come to this place on this day when everybody's smiling and dressed just so and seems to be happy and all is right in their world and you're thinking my world is anything but happy and joyful. I'm anything but content. I'm anything but ready. Do you realize that Jesus came to a moment like that? The very Son of God, eternally equal with Father and Spirit, came to a moment in his earthly ministry when he was begging for a way out. Now you and I have all been there in the moment where our mama or daddy said it's time to pay the price and you and I deserved it. We deserved the, the spanking that was coming. We deserved the time out that we got. We deserved the punishment that was doled out. But we found ourselves crying out, Mama, no! Daddy, no! Do you realize that the priceless, precious, perfect Son of God came to a moment in his earthly ministry when what was about to be doled out he did not deserve and he found himself in a garden where he had often been saying, Father, no! If there's any other way, if there's any other method, if you can save by any other means, let the hour pass. Let the cup be poured out in a different way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was another garden in Scripture, a garden where all of this story of humanity began. It was the Garden of Eden. In that garden, God created the first two people to ever live, your great, 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 great granddaddy and grandmommy, just like mine. And one day in that garden, Adam and Eve were approached by the enemy, that serpent, the devil, who enticed them to believe something other than the truth of what God had spoken. And on that day, Eve took of fruit that was forbidden and then gave it to her husband, who was standing there the whole time. And complicit in the sin, Adam ate fruit that was forbidden, saying to God and to the devil, Not your will, Father, but mine be done. And in his path, every person who has ever lived has come to a moment, a moral decision, a time when was set before us an option, and every one of us has been just like Adam. We have looked in the face of a holy God, knowing that, that he willed, and we have said, no, Father, not your will, not what you desire, not what you've commanded, but what I will. Because of that, every one of us deserves death. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. But on this day, this holy Thursday, 
Jesus Christ goes to a garden that he's familiar with. It's an olive orchard. It's on the Mount of Olives, just across the Kidron Valley, just there opposite Mount Zion upon which Jerusalem sits. It is a place, Luke tells us, where he has been often. It's the place where he prays. This is Jesus' prayer closet he's going to. Jesus gathers his disciples and takes them to the Mount of Olives, takes them to the Garden of Gethsemane. He leaves eight of them sitting at the entrance to the garden. He says to his beloved three, Peter, James, and John, go on a little further with me. And he gives them a command. Watch. Be alert. Keep your eyes open. See what's going on. Jesus goes, Luke tells us, a stone's throw away. And there he kneels before his father. And unlike Adam, and unlike you and me, who have often looked in the face of the father in spite of our sin and have said, not your will but mine be done, Jesus Christ bows himself before the one whose will will be done on earth as it is in heaven and says, I don't want to face this. I want it to pass from me. Let the hour go away. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And he goes back to his disciples. And he finds that those he has commanded to watch are sleeping. You ever been there in the moment when you just couldn't keep your eyes open? We were chatting earlier this week about going to the movies. I, I do some of my best sleeping in the movies. It's worth it to pay eight or nine dollars and go get that good sleep. I mean, and I'm going to tell you, you folks have a wonderful, wonderful thing in this movie theater in Pell City. That thing is awesome. Those reclining chairs, leather seats, and it's, I mean, it's great. We slipped over there this week and watched a movie on Tuesday night. We saw Dumbo. It's good. You ought to see it. That's free promotion to the movie theater. And the whole time, my wife looked at me and she'd say, are you still awake? Because I have a tendency to fall asleep in these things. I wonder if Jesus knew that Peter, James, and John had a tendency to fall asleep. An hour passed and he walked back over there and he said, Hey, couldn't you keep your eyes open? My dear brother and sister, I wonder how often he comes to us and says, Hey, couldn't you keep your eyes open? Couldn't you watch? Couldn't you pray? Don't you realize what's coming, Jesus says to them? Oh, I know the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Nevertheless, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. When Jesus Christ gives us as his disciples a command, it's not because he's trying to ruin our lives. It's not because he's trying to control our will. It's not because he's trying to keep us from something that's enjoyable. I love to sleep. I think Peter, James, and John love to sleep. But when Jesus looks at them and says, watch and pray, it's not because he's trying to deprive them of something. It's because he's trying to protect them from something. Jesus says, you've got to be alert. You've got to watch and pray. You've got to keep your eyes open. Why? Because if you don't, if you're not careful, if you're not looking, if you're not alert, you're going to enter into temptation. Watch and pray, Jesus says. And Mark tells us that he goes back. You don't get this in all of the evangelists, but Mark tells us that he goes back to the time of prayer. And do you notice what Mark says? He said the same thing. Sometimes our prayers are repetitive. Not because the Father hasn't heard us, but because our wills haven't yet been conformed to his. And so we learn from our Lord to go back and to pray it again. 
Father, let this cup pass for me. Father, let the hour go away. Father, I don't want to face this. There's got to be another way. There's got to be a way out. I need deliverance. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Son of God, has to say it to himself and to his Father over and over and over again until it becomes a reality. I don't want to die, but I know I might have to. I don't want to die, but I know I might have to. I don't want to die. But I know I might have to. He comes back. They're sleeping again. And he gives them a stir for a third time. He goes back and he prays again. Three hours he watches in prayer. The evangelist, gospel writer Luke, tells us that his body is so tormented by the weight of the hour that he is sweating drops of blood. So tormented that the Father dispatches angels to minister to him. This is not a quiet, passive, peaceful time in prayer. It is a powerful, persistent pleading as he begs Father, If there's any other way, not my will, thine be done. The final time Jesus comes to his disciples, they're asleep again. And Jesus says to them, the hour has come. Do you notice what's happened in the text? Do you notice what's happened in Jesus' life? He has gone from begging in the first verses of the passage, let the hour pass, to accepting the hour has come. He's gone from saying, I don't want to drink the cup, to saying, I'll take it. He's gone from saying, let this pass for me, I don't want this, this isn't my will, to being fully resolved, not my will, but yours be done, Father. It is in that transformation brought about by his communing with the Father in prayer that the Son of God fully embraces the Father's will and goes to the cross to drink the cup of God's wrath poured out against sinners. This cup is nothing new in the Gospel of Mark. There was an occasion in Mark chapter 10 when James and John, two of Jesus' most trusted disciples, two of the inner circle, two who could not watch and pray, When they came to Jesus and they said to him, Lord, grant it to us, one to sit at your right and one to sit at your left when we come into your kingdom. Do you remember what Jesus said back to those arrogant disciples? He challenged them. He said, do you know what you're asking? Do you know what it is you want? You say, let me sit at your right, let me sit at your left. What you're asking is to drink my cup. Can you do that? Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized, Jesus says? Not talking about water, not talking about the Passover, not a cup of mercy and grace, but a cup of wrath. The same challenge that Jesus gave to James and John is what he gives to you. He asks you and he asks me, will we drink the Father's cup? Will we be baptized with the baptism with which our Lord was baptized? Will we enter into the season of prayer to be transformed from a person who says, not your will, but mine be done, to a person who says, not my will, but thine be done? Or are we playing a cosmic claw game? Popping in a quarter, breathing 
not at all holding our tongue just right and in the discipline of prayer not seeking to be conformed to the will of the Father, not to have our weak flesh strengthened, but simply to have him give us what we want. See, there was that day in our family's life when everything else that we had always known was up in the air. And my mama found herself wondering, how am I going to do this? How am I going to take care of a sick husband? How am I going to take care of somebody who will need more care than I can provide? How in the world are we going to make it? And the next morning, I found my mother where she is every morning of her life, sitting in a gold lazy boy recliner, a cup of coffee in one hand and a Bible in the other, sitting in a space that she and Jesus have made holy and asking her to make the flesh as willing as the Spirit, asking the Father to help her to do His will. 21 days later when my dad went to be with the Lord she was still right there calling upon his name you came here with something today something that wearies your mind or troubles your soul maybe even something that has hardened your heart And just like Jesus, you come to the weightiness of this hour saying, I can't do it. I can't face it. Don't want any part of it. And the God of heaven and earth would say to you, just as he says to me, your spirit may be willing. Your flesh is weak. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. My dear friend, if all you know is the truth of the gospel, you'll be satisfied to have a willing spirit and a weak flesh. But if because of what Jesus Christ has done, if because he has entered into the hour and drunk the cup of the Father's wrath, if because he has gotten to the place where he said, not my will, but yours be done, if because you put your faith in what he did in dying upon the cross and being raised from the dead for you, if by faith you enter into his sacrifice, then you'll find the grace of God ministering to you so that your weak flesh is strengthened. Not so you get everything you want, but so that you can do the Father's will. If you're here today, and that's not where you are, if you're wanting to do anything but what God wants, if you're trusting in anything but what Christ has done, if you're satisfied to know everything about Jesus but not follow him by faith, then on this day before you leave this place, you ought to hit your knees crying out for the mercy of God. And pray until like Jesus, your will is conformed to that of the Father. So that you would not leave this place like Adam in the Garden of Eden saying, not your will but mine be done. But so that in the footsteps of Christ, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you could say, because of what Jesus has done for me, not my will, Father, but yours be.